Hey, it's Goal Oriented, Episode 6. I'm your host, Chandler Engelbrett, and I'm joined by Mason Young and Austin Kurtwright. Boys, six podcasts. We're finally here. We're, we're just coming out of OU's game against Kansas, uh, which was a lot more surprising than anyone expected, because, uh, again, remember last week we chose not to talk about it at length. Probably should have. Mason, what did you think of last week's performance for the Sooners? Yeah, you know, a uh, tale of two halves, right? I mean, in the first half, OU was shut out for the first time in a long time. Um, can't remember the exact statistic of when that was. Uh, oh, yeah, 2014, a uh, bowl game against Clemson. Uh, so it was really weird to see the OU offense struggle um, at the beginning, and the defense wasn't playing exceptional either. Um, and But in the second half, they got that all straightened out. Um, Caleb Williams made one of the craziest plays you'll ever see, which I'm sure we'll unpack that in more detail. Um, oh, you got its offense rolling thanks to him and Kennedy Brooks, and they weathered the uh, weird storm of the power going out <laughs> and the scoreboard at the stadium not working, and then uh, also increased Kansas fan presence after they were basically invited freely into the stadium. So. Yeah, let's uh, let's unpack that for a bit. Obviously, we drove five hours to not so sunny Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, it's mostly hills uh, from my observation. Austin, you're with us every step of the way. What did you see? Um, yeah, I thought the Lawrence trip was actually not too bad. Tried Culver's for the first time. It was pretty good. Um, most people will probably hate my opinion, but it's a worse version of Freddy's. But um, yeah, Lawrence was honestly a pretty cool town. I think it was maybe the coolest college town that we've been to. We've been to obviously, um, well, Dallas is not a college town, but <laughs> we uh, went to Manhattan already. So that was fun. But yeah, the the game was pretty weird. I thought it was funny. There wasn't a official attendance number just because they're like, hey, anyone that's here, come to our game for free because we're beating the number three team in the country right now at halftime. But um, it's just a weird game to watch from the beginning. Obviously, everyone in the press box was fighting the um, power shortage that happened there for like more than half of the first quarter where we were all connected to Mason's hotspot for a little bit. <laughs> um but, yeah, no one really expected that game to go that way. Um, Lincoln doubled down on that sentiment today at his press conference on Tuesday. But it was definitely a game that I don't think anyone um, suspected. But um, we'll see if OU can sort of battle out of this sort of hole they're in. Outside of everything you said about uh, Culver's, I agree with you entirely. That was definitely a game none of us thought would uh, would go that way. Um, I think what was a better game to watch was uh, when we played NCAA 14 the night before and uh, we kind of rotated the games we were playing. Shout out to Trey Young, not the basketball player, but OU Daily photo editor for letting us stay at his house. His family is very nice, and his house was badass. Um, but yeah, that was super fun. Austin beat me in NCAA for the first time in, I think, 50 attempts. Uh, so he'll uh, he'll definitely wear that as a badge of honor. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a game that uh, everyone's going to look back on probably at the end of the season and be like, what, what was that about? Um, Mason, other takeaways you have from the Lawrence trip? Um... OU really needs its secondary to get healthy. Um, they have a lot of issues there, and we saw Billy Bowman playing corner again for the second week, and it wasn't really working. Um, so that was kind of an interesting takeaway from the game, just how badly they could really use having Woody Washington and, and DJ Grant back. Um, as far as our trip itself, I thought that a uh, Oriad place on, on Kansas' campus that was basically like a castle – student union hotel right across the street from the stadium yeah i'm not sure what that thing was but that place is cool and i definitely want to check that out uh if i ever get to go to lawrence again so what you think of culver's yeah culver's is good uh i would give the chicken <laughs> and of course i'm a resident chicken connoisseur so i would know but i'll give the chicken like a probably like a six you got chicken at a burger place yeah. <laughs> fry fries nothing special probably like a four or five shake Probably also like a six or seven. I mean, it's comparable to a Freddy's shake because they're going frozen custard as well. But uh, so I'm at this point, I don't even care what Mason's opinion is on food because <laughs> it's so bad. But uh, back to the game itself, I I think it'll be interesting to see this week um, with the return of Jalen Redmond from injury that Lincoln said today they expect him to be available versus Texas Tech. So I assume that'll move Isaiah Thomas back to end and. Jalen back to tackle, but I'll be interesting to see if the defensive line can create a little bit more pressure um, with their typical starting unit back. Um, they obviously have only had one sack 
OU has only had one sack the last two games, and it came against Kansas in the fourth quarter, I think it was. But Not very good. Yeah, not very good. And obviously the secondary has struggled, but when – the secondary has obviously struggled, but when the defensive line's not getting any pressure, it makes their job even harder. And it obviously makes the defensive line's job harder too when the secondary is playing bad and there's always people wide open um, – you know, you have to have a little bit of time to be able to cause pressure just because of the nature of the game. But, yeah. you know, those two positions have kind of gone hand in hand the last few weeks during these struggles. Obviously, the end result of that was Caleb Williams in his first road start in his career obviously has this huge boulder on his shoulder now that he has to carry, uh, which is having to come back over Kansas. A uh, bit of a weird task, but he excelled in that second half. Obviously, it was the play that uh, Mason mentioned earlier, where Kenny Brooks was stuffed on, I believe it was like a fourth and one, fourth and three, somewhere in that vein. Um, Kennedy Brooks is going down, in which Caleb Williams comes up and just grabs the ball from him and runs for a first down. When that moment happened in the press box, I said aloud, oh my God. And Austin turned and hit me and said, dude, why are you screaming in the press box? I was like, that's never happened before ever. Like, I've never seen that in a game, and I've watched tons of them. So, Mason, what did you think of Caleb Williams' second-half performance against the Jayhawks? Yeah, you know, he just seemed a lot more composed. I mean, in the first half, he threw that interception, and it obviously looked like he was trying to force something because he threw to Jaden Hazelwood in a, in a one-on-one where the coverage was good. But he had, uh, I think it was either Kennedy Brooks or Eric Gray, was like wide open in the flat for a dump off um, and could have got some yardage back. But... Second half, much better, very composed. You referenced that play, and he also had like a 40-plus yard touchdown run on a different drive where he was in a fourth and short situation. So uh, he just continues to add a different dimension to this OU offense that they didn't exactly have with Spencer Rattler where um, he they're able to move the ball so much more effectively because he's a dual threat. He can hurt you with his arm. He can hurt you with his legs, and that's gone – hand-in-hand hand really well with also getting Kennedy Brooks going um, as a rusher for OU the last several games. So um, from here, things can only continue to go up, in my opinion. I think Caleb Williams was the fix for whatever you would consider OU's offensive issues to be. And uh, despite, yeah, okay, they got shut out in the first half. Uh, I would almost take that as an anomaly. This game was just like a just weird in general, and I wouldn't expect – OU's offense to get shut out in any half the rest of the season. It, it sort of comes weird though when we're talking about anomaly games because it feel like it feels like OU has had a lot of those Tulane, Nebraska. I mean, first half of Texas, it was like what's going on. It, it still feels like OU outside of against TCU has still had that hasn't had that huge offensive performance game. But speaking of Williams, uh, Austin, I'm going to throw this question to you. This was a guy that when he had that TC performance and obviously the Red River Showdown performance, he was in the conversation for not winning it, but being at least in the Heisman conversation, in the race. Um, he comes out against Kansas. Obviously, he lays an egg in the first half. Um, but still, the, the second half, he has a play that I've never seen before. He has the huge touchdown run. He looks great. Is Caleb Williams, is that Heisman push still a thing at this point? Or do you think because of you know his performance in the first half, that's all but gone? I'm going to go ahead and say no, as great as Caleb has been. I think it's just going to be you know a little bit too late on his production there. But um, obviously people are going to jump to conclusions when he has a crazy game against TCU and be like, oh, OU has another Heisman candidate. He's Heisman ready. Um, I, I think it's going to be too late. Um, you know, as great as he played in the second half, should OU have been in that position where he has to will them to victory in the second half against Kansas? No. Like, that's right. I mean, Kansas is, should, had no reason to be in that game. I understand, you know, teams that are going to give their best game to OU. And like Lincoln said today at his press conference, sometimes what they do, what other teams do on tape is going to be completely different than what they do when they show up just because he compared, you know, opponents playing OU is like OU playing Texas every week. And that's how it is for teams getting to play top five teams in the Big 12. You know, it's one of those things that they're obviously going to play up to their competition. And like some players said, like Kennedy Brooks said after the game, they played down to their competition. So I, I back to the question, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say no for Caleb Williams on Heisman Watch. Um, I'm sort of pretty stuck on, I think they're just going to give it to the player that is 
willing a team that's maybe not that good to be good. So, like, Matt Corral, Ole Miss is a great example. If they didn't have him, they probably would not be very good in the SEC. Mason, I'm going to say the same question to you. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think Austin brought up a lot of good points there, and um, I think it's going to – It's in my opinion, it's a two-horse race. It's either uh, Matt Corral or uh, Bryce Young from Alabama. Mm-hmm. Um, earlier in the season, I, for some reason, had this, like, weird affinity with – Kenneth Walker, the Michigan State running back, I guess maybe just because it's kind of a change of pace. A lot of people talk about him. It'd be interesting to see what a non-quarterback could do, but I think it's between Corral and and Bryce Young, and hats off to Caleb Williams for everything that he's been able to do in such a short span of time, but I think it's just going to come a little too late for him to really make a Heisman push. Can he still get that New York invite, though? No, because I just think he's, what, now, like fifth or sixth in the odds? I, I just don't I, I see the potential for someone to kind of jump ahead of him um, within the coming weeks, um, and especially after the the first half let down last week. That kind of changes some things a little bit in my mind. Um, I mean, could he? Yeah, like as one of like the very like latter candidates, mm-hmm. um, potentially he could. But I see him kind of maybe finishing like just outside that window of getting to make the trip to New York, in my opinion. Although, um, to bring up another point, OU obviously finishes the season with Baylor, Iowa State, OSU, potentially all top 20 teams when they play Mm -hmm. them. Um, You know, always everyone knows that you have big moments and big games. That's kind of going to give you that Heisman push. So there's always an opportunity for that to happen. I think it's more of a, a long shot, but definitely is, you know, on the table still. Now's a good time to plug. Uh, Mason, before the season, wrote about a 6,000-word story on Spencer Rattler. Um, you can still read that. It's still a really, really good story. Um, however, right now, it's it's a little outdated. Who knows? Just got to write another one about Caleb Williams, right, eventually? Yeah, I guess. And, I mean, I, I think, honestly, I would I would give my hat to Spencer Rattler as well for, like, noticed him on the sidelines, chatting guys up. He's right in the fray. You know, he's still doing – the duties on the sideline that are becoming a being a captain and I think he would be ready to play um, whenever he was called upon if that were a situation that happened so um, he's kind of been a constant through this process he's been even keeled and and from everything that we've heard and sounds like that he's going to be in a good position um, regardless of what happens after this season so I think the best for Spencer Rattler is yet to come and yeah uh, definitely check out that story it's uh there's there's some pieces of it that are, you're kind of like huh ah. but there's other parts of it that that are i think really telling about the character of spencer rattler that is less easily perceived sometimes or the the character of spencer rattler that is skewed in public opinion right well um this was obviously a game that we thought we'd get to see spencer rattler re-enter uh, for the Sooners, he did not get that chance because, again, they were trailing at halftime to Kansas and had to have a comeback victory. Um, with that, I kind of want to jump into our mailbag question of the day. Um, this is from B.D. Jamison on Twitter. Um, I only picked his question because every other person that responded to our call-out pretty much said the same thing. I'm um, going to open this up to both of you. Either one of you can answer. Uh, he says, why does the defense continue to play so bad? He's talking about OU, of course. And then he says, our injuries, or no, he says, injuries are not an excuse. That's his opinion. I, uh, not that our audience is wrong, but I don't know if you can really <laughs> chalk it up to anything more than injuries. I mean, yeah. it's been obviously a huge problem with the depth there. And I think it's pretty telling that Alex Grinch would rather play a freshman Billy Bowman who's never played corner before over someone like Josh Eaton or Latrell McCutcheon, in my opinion. I think that's pretty telling of where they're at. Um, as, as a team, obviously, I think that, like I mentioned earlier, Redmond moving back inside, who was really, really good in the first three games, helps not just him, but he helps Isaiah Thomas, who gets to move back to his natural position of defensive end because the other tackles had been so bad. I think Josh Ellison, who had – Josh Ellison, I think, played the very first snap of the season at, at tackle. He only played three snaps against Kansas. So I think it's pretty telling of what the progress is there. Um, Lincoln Riley keeps mentioning that – he thinks that injuries coming back are going to provide a spark for this team. And he keeps talking about how really, really close they are to having such a really good team, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a second more. But um, that's sort of my analysis on it. Um, I, you know, the, the defense played really well at the beginning of the year. 
I'm, I'm not necessarily sure. I, c- I can't chalk it up to a scheme issue or something. I'm not an X's and O's genius like some are, but um, the only thing I could really chalk it up to at this point is injuries, and that's something we'll have to see as they get those guys back the next few weeks. Mason? If you were going to try to make the case that it's not related to injuries, here's what I think your argument would be. I don't necessarily think it's the scheme. I don't necessarily think it's who's playing the certain numbers of snaps. I think everybody's playing the snaps they're supposed to be. It's the personnel decisions, not so much in number of snaps or quantity, but in certain situations. And we talked about on the on the ride back, Austin and I did, of like, yeah, remember when Kansas was in the red zone and they deployed this like really weird all-reserve defensive line? You were like, why is this the group that's out here in this situation when – you're down 10-7, and Kansas is about to score again. So I don't – and again, like like Austin said, not an expert on scheme, also not an expert – like I'm not the coach. I, I, I can't say definitively like, oh, yeah, Alex Grinch put the wrong group out there at that time. I think if you were going to try to chalk up this issue, this defensive struggles to something, though, it would be that. But to be honest, I would more err on the side that – getting some of these guys back from injury is going to be the real solvent. I think you guys nailed it. Um, obviously, the, the rotations, uh, Grinch liking to just put as many bodies out there as he can in a game, something that irritates a lot of fans. Uh, I'll go ahead and give another shout-out to former OU Daily Sports editor George Stoya, who likes to shout air out, out his uh, Alex Grinch opinion pretty much every Saturday, uh, mainly with questioning why Nick Benito is not on the field for every minute of the game. Uh, but, hey. To each his own, right? Uh, definitely think the injuries can be an excuse here. Uh, at this point, I'm just reiterating stuff you guys have said, but it's kind of hard to win when your best players aren't even in the game. Um, but with that, um, like Austin said earlier, today is Tuesday. It's October 26. Uh, Lincoln Riley had his presser today. Uh, again, catered by Midway Deli. Love that place. You guys went. I was in class. What'd you see out there, Mason? Yeah, so Austin already touched on it a little bit, but... Lincoln said Jalen Redmond will be back against uh, Texas Tech, and I think that's huge. Um, uh, To be honest, he was probably OU's best pass rusher before he was supposedly injured against Nebraska, Um, and by getting him in there and deploying him at tackle and moving Isaiah Thomas back to the edge, um, this OU pass rush becomes a lot better Um, and a lot more like it was in non-conference play where they were racking up the sacks and TFLs. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, someone like Jalen Redmond is going to get a lot of pressure and push the pocket, and that's going to create opportunities for Isaiah Thomas off the edge and also Nick Benito. So I think there's only good things that could come from that. Um, Lincoln Riley also talked about a a pair of receivers and, and their status for the upcoming game, but I'll let Austin get into that a little bit. Yeah, so Lincoln talked about Mike Woods and Mario Williams, who Mike Woods suited up for the um, game in Lawrence but didn't play. Uh, Mario Williams was not with the team for the game. Uh, But he said that they are going to be limited this week and possibly will be back Saturday. Didn't give a clear timeline on when they might return, but I mentioned those two guys who could be back. But uh, back to the Jalen Redmond thing, it's so crazy to me that he two years ago led the team in sacks on a Peach Bowl team that made the college football playoff, and he's still only a redshirt sophomore because he sat out the 2020 season. I think he's one of OU's most underrated players on the entire roster that doesn't get talked about because people are so hyped about Nick Bedino and Isaiah Thomas and Perrion Winfrey that Jalen Redman is definitely up there with you know some of the more talented pass rushers in the conference, I'd say. Well, and also, I mean, flashing back to those two receivers we just talked about, um, Marvin Mims has had his moments this season. Jaden Hazelwood has had his moments this season, but Mike Woods has started almost every game. Mario Williams is the one of the biggest receiving contributors off the bench, mm-hmm. and they're really just kind of even keel. Like, if you looked at their stat line, they have almost an identical number of catches. The yard differential isn't much, and they both have two touchdowns this season. So those are guys that are really steady um, catching the ball for OU's offense, and Lincoln Riley even uh, was asked about and said, like, yeah, without them against Kansas, that affected – some things that we did offensively. And there were other bright spots in the receiving group against Kansas. Jalil Farouk played quite a bit, and Trey West, who West. who left the team um, in spring practice and, what a wild and then came back. Yeah. yeah, I really would love to know some more about that. But he had like a 66-yard rush off of a reverse in that game that 
put OU in scoring position, like literally one play after Kansas When's got the a last touchdown? time OU ran a reverse and didn't throw it, you know? Like he just They've been ran. doing that with Mario a lot this really? year. The reverse where Mario throws it back. Shout out little baseball player there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But but to Chandler's point, like usually it's like some sort of like not necessarily a flea flicker, but like a double pass. It's not usually as much of like a run. Um, and it, it also just like when they do run it, sometimes it hasn't been as successful as it was that time. But so anyway, back to what we were talking about. They missed Mike Woods and Mario Williams against Kansas. And if those guys aren't ready to play against Texas Tech, that could, again, limit what they're able to do in terms of throwing the ball. Speaking of Texas Tech, let's go ahead and jump into that. Uh, obviously, they play the Red Raiders this Saturday at 2.30. Um, this is the last game they have before a bye week. Um, now, before we talk about the Tech game, which obviously is going to be, uh, I'm not going to say a, a easy game. I'm not going to say it's a hard game, but it is an opponent that OU's had trouble with historically, um, or historically recently. Um, so, yeah, it could be could be really tough. But how much is the bye week? How, how much do you think they're, they're looking ahead to that? Because, again, they played nine weeks. It's the most. It's the most they've done that since the early 2000s. This team is injured. They're banged up. How excited? Either one of you can answer this. How excited do you think they are to just get a week off? You know, I, I think that's an interesting point to take up. Is obviously the players' sort of theme after the game was, yeah, we played down to our opponent against Kansas. You know, but I think this is a game that they shouldn't overlook. Obviously, Texas Tech just fired their head coach midseason, midweek, which is, you know, weird information that is probably I. What I guess is not ideal, obviously, <laughs> but um, this would be an easy game to sort of come out flat in like OU did against Kansas. Um, it's the week before a bye week where they've played nine consecutive games to open a season. I don't even know how that comes about, but mm-hmm. that's just bad, obviously, for any team. And obviously, they're looking forward to getting all these injuries back. So I think this is a week that... Oh, you could easily look over, but I think that what happened at Kansas a week before might be a good test to be like, we cannot, you know, as a team, OU cannot do that again, um, looking forward to this week you know, as sort of a test. Right. Only only to further that point, in my opinion, I mean, this has got to be, this cannot be, oh, the buy's coming, we're almost there. It has to be, the buy's coming, let's keep our foot down on the gas and roll into it. And, and really embrace the challenge of this week that is, yeah, maybe we're going to have an inferior opponent, but let's go get it and go out to the bye week strong and just get even better. And with all of the self-inflicted wounds that Lincoln sort of talked about, which really hurt OU again in the Kansas game, um, Texas Tech is hasn't been great this season, but they're not as bad as Kansas. I'm not sure that if OU came out the same way they did against Kansas, that they can sort of rebound and end up closing out a victory against Texas Tech like they came with Kansas. Mm-hmm. I think you know this is a game that could easily sneak up on OU, even though it's Texas Tech without their head coach, who hasn't necessarily been that great this yeah, season. Yeah, Tech was up at halftime by, I believe, two touchdowns over Kansas State last week. That's obviously a team that played OU down to the wire um, in Manhattan at the beginning of this month. Um, so this this team, again, could be a tough challenge. And if OU's looking ahead to that bye week as a chance to finally get some rest, they could sneak up on them. Mason, you got anything else? And I mean, only and, and only to add to that point, I mean, their acting head coach is Sonny Cumbie, who kind of knows Lincoln Riley pretty well. They know each other pretty well. And, uh, I mean, they can see. Um, they, it doesn't really even take film to know, like, what OU's secondary deficiencies are. And, you know, they're going to attack that. I wouldn't be surprised if they come out and, and throw the ball like 40, 50 times a game because that's what they do anyway. That's a Texas Tech offense. So that makes the return of Jalen Redmond even more pivotal this week. And then you hope to get those other guys back after the bye. You know, the the discourse between Sonny Cumbie and Lincoln Riley knowing each other brought up a point I wanted to mention earlier is, um, you know, it seems like Lincoln has sort of been – this is obviously speculation, but it seems like his play calling has been a bit more conservative this season, maybe than years past. And I think that's interesting. Back to the point, the the Trey the Trey West reverse is almost like a play that he sort of had to pull out of his bag of tricks that he's maybe saving for the end of the season. I think that's another thing that's interesting in this point. But um, you know, Texas Tech is a Texas Tech offense. They're going to come out and throw the ball a lot. Um, but I crunched some of the numbers. I looked at them earlier. And, it's definitely the one of the worst Texas Tech units of the last few years or so, but um, it's definitely not a team that you can just 
you know, walk into hoping you can just get an easy win with walking through and going through the motions. All right. That said, let's go ahead and dive into some predictions and keys to the game for OU this time around. Obviously, we kind of just do this off the cuff when it comes to prediction stuff. But uh, Mason, uh, what do you think OU needs to do to win this game? And uh, what's your prediction for the score? We've talked a lot about what's needed on the defense. So I'm going to go offense here. And for me, it's start fast, you know. I thought it was really interesting last week that Kansas won the toss and they elected to receive because they wanted to score right away and set the tone first. Set the tone. Yeah, I'm not necessarily saying, oh, you should do that if they win the toss this weekend. I don't – but, like, when you get the ball first, go score and set the tone for what your offensive pace is going to be for the rest of the game. Make sure that you do not get shut out in the first quarter or in the first half again. What's your score? Uh, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go 52, 45. I think it's going to be a shootout and closer than people think it will be. But of course, every time that we pick a shootout this season, it ends up being like 17, 14. So (laughs) we'll see what happens. And I also just thought of that off the top of my head. So it's probably not even close. Austin. I think another key is just being able to get off the field on defense. I think that's sort of was the theme beginning of the year was OU's having all these close games because they're having eight possessions on offense because the offense, the opposing offense is going 17 plays in 10 minutes, sort of like Kansas went a 10-minute drive, 14 plays, and scored, obviously limiting OU's chances to you know, respond with an offensive score of their own. But um, that wasn't necessarily seen as much as an issue in the Texas and the TCU games. People started you know, not really talking about that as much, but – that's sort of been what teams have been able to expose OU early on and keep OU in these close games is um, limiting their chances on offense. And that sort of brings up another point is I'm not sure that Lincoln can necessarily trust his defense like he has earlier on in the season. It, sort of back to the Caleb Williams and Kennedy Brooks play against against Kansas is fourth and three late in the fourth quarter in his own in OU's own territory going for it and, you know, he would rather OU have a chance to keep the drive going on offense rather than punt it and pin Kansas back deep in their own territory with, I think, two, a minute 30, two minutes ago in the game, which was honestly a, a decision I didn't quite think uh, would even happen. But that sort of brings up another thing uh, for me. So I think the defense has got to get more three and outs and it's got to sustain drives that get the get, get the offense a chance to score. Right. You guys both went defense, and I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to say it's just forcing turnovers for them. I mean, they only had one against Kansas. I believe they only had one against TCU. Um, Obviously taking the ball away from the opposing offense because they, again, struggled off the field on third down. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to their defensive backs right now because they're injured, they're kind of just getting picked on. Um, So, I mean, for them to maybe get an interception or force another fumble or two, that's going to go a long way. What did OU in the first half against Kansas last week? It was kind of a a familiar story that we saw them early on in the year. They only had three possessions. Defense can get off. You can get that by getting them off the field on third down. You can mm-hmm. also do that by just taking the ball away. Um, Austin, before I say my score, what was your score? I think you I, skipped yeah, it. Yeah, I forgot. Go back. I forgot to go score. I'm going to go, sheesh, uh, I'm going to go 45 <laughs> 34. My prediction score is going to be 38-17. Uh, I think this is sort of lower scoring uh, compared to former OU Texas Tech games, um, but still uh, I think OU will pull away in the end and, and put up some big plays, separate them. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up now. Uh, but before we do, filling in for one Justin Jane today is none other than Colin McDaniel, videographer for the OU Daily. Colin, thank you so much for joining the show. You will be taking over the mystery question duties. What do you have for us? Get well oh. soon, Justin. <laughs> yeah, get well soon. Um, one of my favorite things is to watch people argue about like AP rankings on Twitter. That is like one of my favorite conversations. Um, okay. So I was just kind of wondering, um, do you think preseason rankings and hype matters? And does that play a role like this far down the road? Because like in my opinion, I think preseason rankings can cause a lot of like confirmation bias with teams that we've known and we've seen in the top four i.e. like a one-loss Alabama team above a few undefeated teams. So do you think like potentially even OU is kind of riding that hype that they had even preseason? You want to go ahead, Austin? Sure. Um, Yeah, I mean, obviously people would like to say like, oh, I hope OU's players aren't, you know, buying stock in what the media is saying. But obviously it's 
unavoidable. People are every player on the team is going to be like see OU getting chosen or chosen to win the national championship and stuff like that. But um, I don't know if people really bring that much stock into the AP rankings. As far as OU OU's concerned, they know if they go undefeated and they win every game, they're going to make it into the college football playoff. And to be honest, now with the college football playoff committee, I don't know that necessarily anyone really cares that much about the AP rankings as it goes on because, like I said, OU knows that if they go undefeated, they'll be in that top four. And, you know, anything can happen when the committee chooses their own rankings because we've seen it in the past where they'll put a one-loss team over an undefeated team or – an undefeated team that struggled like OU could very well be above Cincinnati when the initial rankings come out. Um, So I'm going to go ahead and say no, even though I could definitely see why um, people would get that sort of confirmation bias from those preseason rankings or week-to-week rankings. Mason, got something here? Yeah, I mean, I think like we've, and this is a conversation that I've had with other people before, is like the AP poll almost kind of feels outdated. Like it's all about the college football playoff poll and – Austin, you and I have talked about this before, but like it wouldn't be that surprising to see, like, let's say the college football playoff poll comes out, OU goes undefeated, and Cincinnati maybe is also undefeated. I think the college football playoff committee puts OU over Cincinnati in the rankings. Like, I don't think they're, I don't think they would be necessarily as high on Cincinnati as maybe the Associated Press voters are. So uh, that's, uh, we'll see what happens, but. I don't. I don't think OU is still buying in the, into the preseason hype. They have to worry about what's going on right now in terms of hype. I mean, you're still undefeated and you still have a target on your back. So they've got to worry about just going out there and doing their job and taking it week by week and winning. Now I can agree with you guys more. Uh, at this point in the season, I don't care about the AP poll. Um, obviously, it's it's a good kind of measuring stick for how you compare teams. But because of the CFP, or College Football Playoff Committee, rather, um, I, I've lost interest in that. I, I more care what they have to say, because what they say immediately affects who's in the playoff. Um, but with the preseason stuff, I can see how a team uh, like OU doesn't care about it, because like you said, Austin, they go undefeated, they're in the playoff. And Alabama, I think, makes sense to get that top spot, or any defending champ. Uh, because if you, in my opinion, if you win the national championship, you should probably be number one going into the next year unless you've had just complete roster changes and you're a completely different team. But for a team like Clemson, um, who going into the year was looked at as being just as good as they were last year, and now they're like, what, four and two, or or they've had multiple losses, they're not looking too great. Um, I, I think that does affect them, and maybe it makes their program look a little uneasy right now, especially with you know other head coaching opportunities opening up across the country that maybe Dabo might look at including one LSU, but who knows? Uh, I don't think there's too much stock in AP poll anymore, uh, and rightfully so. Austin, anything before we cut? Just one more thing before we go. Um, you know, I, th- I think it'll be really interesting to see what the college football playoff committee has to, um, how, how they evaluate OU, because I wonder how much stock they bring in the close matchups they had at the early start of the year when Spencer Rattler was quarterback. Do they only look at the games where Caleb Williams is the quarterback because obviously we've seen OU is sort of a different team with him under center. So I, I kind of wonder how they balance that because obviously they, they think a lot about the conference title or you know the conference record or uh, strength of schedule, but obviously the eye test is obviously always going to be there. So I wonder uh, how they sort of evaluate that. Right. But also in that vein, I think if OU has a really big November and they convincingly beat Baylor and – Iowa State and Oklahoma State, like recency bias only works in their favor. So there's like a lot of different ways you could cut that. When does that first committee poll come out? Is that that's during OU's bye week? It's actually, week, du- yeah, yeah, it's actually during the bye week. So that'll be really interesting to see where they are initially and then compare it to where they are after w- what really projects to be in November the most difficult part of their schedule so far this season. Let me end this with this question. Do you guys think Cincinnati's going to make the playoff? Man, that's it's tough to say. Um, it's it's with how weird this season's been. Obviously, Clemson's out of it. Uh, I think it comes down to who wins between Georgia and Alabama, in my opinion. Um, obviously, it'll probably be Georgia versus Alabama in the SEC championship game. Georgia's number one. Alabama is cu- currently four or three. Yeah, they're currently mm-hmm. three. But um, Alabama beats Georgia. It would hard be hard for me to see Georgia not making the playoff. So if two SEC teams get in and then OU. I think maybe 
someone like Oregon could possibly slip in. Maybe yep. a Pac-12 champion would get in over an undefeated Cincinnati team that wins the American. But um, Cincinnati's going to have to get past a uh, shout out OU backup, uh, former OU backup Tanner Mordecai and SMU here oh, in yeah. a few weeks. I don't know if that's and this Calcatera. week. But it's definitely yeah. coming up. It's soon. Yeah, uh, they got you know former OU gunslinger and then a former OU tight end slash California firefighter uh, Grant Calcaterra. Uh, you know, catching those touchdowns. Oh, back. I I don't. I said Pac-12 champion. Um, I think probably the Big Ten champion would get in. I I yeah. I think Ohio State's been rolling. That is, I think they'll probably get in. Okay. All right. Let's call it there, Colin. Thank you so much for asking that question. I know we completely derailed from it, <laughs> but great question. Really appreciate you coming on. Uh, another thank you to Georgia Bomar, the producer, filling all the way in for uh, Justin Jane today, who's out sick. Get better, buddy. And again, thank you so much for listening, audience. We really appreciate it. Uh, stay tuned to OUDaily.com and follow us on all our social medias to stay up to date on all things OU football and other OU news. This has been Chandler Engelbrett alongside Mason Young and Austin Curtright. We will see you next time.